The simple truth of the matter is that I hate freaking tribute shows in wrestling. And the very simple reason for that is twofold. Is number one, that I know when you have one of these tribute shows, it means somebody died. And in particular, if they're going out of their way to do a time bell salute and run video packages and kind of make it a tribute show to that individual, you know it was somebody of some importance and consequence, as it was clearly the case with Roddy Roddy Piper. So it's very sad to think about somebody that you watched for so many years and was such an integral part of you becoming a professional wrestling fan, being memorialized in this way. Not that WWE did anything in a tacky manner or did anything in a poor manner. It's just the simple representation of the fact that the man is no longer with us. He has passed. And it's also, as you sit there and you think back on that performer and that character and his career, and you look back on those old highlights from the past, it ultimately reminds you of how good the past used to be and, frankly, how crappy the current present is of the WWE. So it's another bad thing on top of that. Now, obviously, I'm not going to knock the WWE for doing what they did because I thought they did it very well. You know, as far as people rocking the Hot Rod shirts, it's like, yeah, yeah, go to our WWE shop and buy the merch. You know, I'm not even going to knock them for that because if they're going to give a large portion of that money to Piper's family, then, hey, whatever. Piper could sit there and say, I'm still drawing money from beyond the grave in the big Piper's pit up in the sky. But, you know, on the one hand, we'll sit there. It's kind of weird. We'll want to see what's going to happen on Raw when somebody like this passes because we want to see how they're going to memorialize them, how they're going to pay tribute to them, how they're going to honor them. But I really don't look forward to these shows again because it means somebody died and somebody important died, somebody of significance died, and as a reminder of the fact that um, I'm getting older. <laughs> it's also a reminder of how good I think the past was and how bad the present currently is. So anyways, let's talk about this week's show. I wasn't really a fan of how Seth Rollins was utilized or featured on this week's show. In fact, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. Now, granted, it wasn't the standard run-of-the-mill authority 15 to 20 minute promo that he's kicking off the show with, and that's a good thing. You know, it was a little bit shorter, sweeter, and to the point. And while I like that Rollins was doing the best that he could to kind of, you know, put the needle into Cena's wound, and, you know, they were emphasizing him breaking his nose and all of this, it still ultimately came across in this segment that the WWE World Heavyweight Champion feels like he has to prove himself to the United States champion, and that's just not the way it should freaking be. And it's now title versus title at SummerSlam. Oh, God. I like the concept, though, of Seth Rollins issuing this open challenge to kind of fuck with Cena and say, you're not the only one that can do it. But I thought the WWE really missed an opportunity here. Yes, the show started off in a somewhat hot fashion because of the match that he had with Neville, and that's fine. But I thought they really could have been creative here and really taken this to a whole nother level if it was Brock Lesnar that answered Seth Rollins' challenge first. It was Brock Lesnar comes out, and he beats the piss out of Seth Rollins, and then Neville comes out and seizes upon the opportunity. Be a much better utilization of lessons than we actually got on the show. And I'm not necessarily a huge fan of Rollins having to go to this length just to be able to hold on and squeak out a victory over Neville of all damn people. I mean, other than here and there, who the hell is Neville really beaten of any consequence or significance? And here is, yet again, your WWE World Heavyweight Champion, yet again, struggling to beat Neville, yet again, this time, in an even bigger struggling fashion. I just absolutely hated how they featured Seth Rollins this week. I understand they were trying to present him as he's not afraid of Cena, he's willing to stand up to Cena, and all the while it just seemed like it's Seth Rollins is just keeping that belt warm for John Cena. And WWE needs an out from Cena in that U.S. title, and it looks like they might be positioning themselves for just that come SummerSlam. Oh, boy. I hated the eight-man tag match because, again, 
It's something involving the tag team division that's just another fucking match. I'm tired of this lazy ass writing. This is pathetic. You have an entire week to map out, plan out, and write out three hours worth of television. This is the best you could come up with. Give me a fucking break. This is completely and totally inexcusable. Now, with that said, at least if anything else, I will sit there and say that the eight-man tag in this case gives me yet another opportunity to hear Titus O'Neil on commentary. Thank you, WWE. As long as Darren Young shuts his mouth and allows Titus Young to do all the talking, then it's just fine with me. And at this point in time, you know what I fucking want? I want Titus O'Neil and Xavier Woods to be able to be on commentary just for the entire length of one Raw show. Why not? It's better than anything else you're doing with the fucking tag team division. And imagine how much better the commentary would be for at least one week. If you got Xavier Woods on this one side, you got Titus O'Neil on the other side, and they're just jabber John back and forth all fucking night. It'd be a whole lot better again than what they're currently doing with the tag division. Yes, it's nice that the Divas are getting two matches on Raw every week. That's great. And yes, it's also nice that these ladies are getting time to actually go out there and have a chance to have a decent match. That's great. And it's also nice that the women are being featured in a somewhat significant and important way by having one of the diva segments be in one of the marquee time slots, in this case being that one hour main event. That's cool. Some fucking revolution though, this shit is stupid. Yes, it's nice, all those things that I just mentioned, but at the end of the day, they're just giving you an extra match, featuring a few more women, and that's it. Every other fucking element of this is exactly the fucking same. It's just like I talked about with that eight-man tag. You have seven days to be able to write something better than the shit that you do. They've had a few weeks now to kind of feel it out, and they still can't give this whole crap with these three women's factions of three any type of purpose or any type of story, and for crying out loud, the submission sorority? As I... Opined on Twitter, that sounds like some dumb shit that a group of 10-year-old girls would come up with for their secret society. The Submission Sorority. That doesn't tell you about the clusterfuck of WWE. I don't know what the hell it does. Revolution means bringing change and affecting positive change. And shaking up the system. How is this any type of revolution whatsoever? And why would anybody continue to believe this falsehood that anything is ultimately going to be any different? The over-under right now for when Vince and or Kevin Dunluke's complete fucking interest in this has got to be Night of Champions. I mean, another week, and it's just fucking matches. Yeah, you're going to sit there and say, oh, it's a wrestling show. It should have matches. It shouldn't be three hours of almost nothing but fucking wrestling and random, pointless, dumb dick, nonsensical wrestling at that. You can take this revolution and blow it out your ass. To me, it just looks like a slightly different packaging of the same old shit. You want to know what was my favorite segment of the night? And I think by far was the best and most well-executed segment of the night. It wasn't that fucking stupid Heyman and Lesnar shit. It was freaking Miz TV. This was a goddamn good segment. You utilize non-wrestling segments to build to a wrestling match. Jeez, what a freaking novel concept. You incorporate The Miz, that's fine. A tribute to the Piper's Pit, good deal. You give Kevin Owens a platform to talk, good deal. You give Cesaro an opportunity to be featured in a different type of way, especially on a show like this, where you're very light on the talk and way too fucking heavy on the wrestling, here's a chance for Cesaro to stand out in a different light and actually give some additional depth to the issue between Kevin Owens and Cesaro. And Miz's facial reactions and the way he's interjecting into this and the guys turn to him and say, shut up, fucking gold. I enjoyed the hell out of this segment. Was that so hard? This is a second straight week. They've done something really, really good involving these two guys, 
And I hope they can keep it up because they can build themselves up a decent, interesting match come SummerSlam. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one that sat there and saw that Brock Lesnar was being announced for this week's show, that he was being promoted for this week's show. And we we're hoping that business was at least going to pick up a little bit. The last time Lesnar was on Raw, it at least was a good start to that show. The things involving Lesnar and Undertaker, you know, helped at least make the first half of the show somewhat interesting, feel somewhat fresh and somewhat different. So I clearly had that hope that they were going to do something here. And instead, it just became more of the same old shit. I'm sorry. I know there's going to be that segment that will always go on social media every time Paul Heyman picks up a microphone and opens up his yap hole, and they're going to talk about how great he is and how awesome he is and all this other shit. Greatest talk of all time. Greatest manager of all time. I'm sorry, y'all, but... Heyman's promos all sound the fucking same. They've always got to have some type of work shoot fucking element to them. And they just are repetitive. It's like, grab microphone, open mouth, say some things, repeat. It all is presented the same. It all comes across the same because he ultimately always says the same shit. And even if you think it's good, and I'm not here to sit there and say that fundamentally it was bad, at some point in time you get a diminishing return off of saying the same shit time after time after time after fucking time. And again, this is part of the issue of doing this whole issue or doing this program between Taker or Lesnar, because in some ways, while some will say, well, you're just having a big monster match and that's all fine and good, yeah, to a degree you may be right, but on the same token, you're sitting there and reminding people why they're supposed to hate Lesnar. And knowing at the end of the day, if it's anybody in that fucking company, that Taker's ultimately going to own your loyalty. He is going to be that dude. And you're going to go against Lesnar for at least that night. And I don't know if that's the right idea and the right thing to do when you're trying to have Lesnar be that monster face. It's like the WWE well, they don't know how to book a monster face because, frankly, if it isn't John Cena, they don't know how to fuck, fuck a book anybody. And when you look at how they book Cena, they do the worst job of booking him compared to any fucking buddy in their damn company. And to me, as I'm sitting there and Lesnar throws the steps up there and he stands on top of them, I'm like, you know, what they could have done with him and Rollins early on in the night would have made such a huge difference. And if you weren't going to have Taker there, then why have Lesnar there? This just seemed like a fucking wasted Lesnar appearance. But with all of that said, the buildup so far to Taker versus Lesnar at SummerSlam 2015 has been leaps and bounds better than Taker versus Lesnar at WrestleMania 30. Part of the whole issue with the streak ending there was that the feud heading in was such shit. If we would have gotten more crap like this heading into WrestleMania 30, ending the streak would have been at least a little bit easier to deal with and swallow. So it's like the WWE is doing this again in part because they know the first match between them at WrestleMania sucked. They know that the story sucked. Frankly, they know that the finish sucked. So this is like their do-over. It's their chance to make it right. And frankly, at this point in time, it's the only real match of any significant interest, if we're being honest right now, that they have for SummerSlam which is scary because that show is going to be four freaking hours. I have to imagine I'm not the only one that when it came time for that six-man tag main event, basically deuced out on Raw and said, eh, that's about enough. I don't really care. You know, to me, the big thing about a main event is it's supposed to, from a Raw standpoint, with it being weekly episodic television, is give you a big kind of dramatic or climatic finish and in a lot of ways get you to want to tune into what's going to happen on next week's show. Instead, you just get a long drawn out tag where you know all along where this is fucking going, the baby faces are going to shine, nothing significant happens, and nothing happens in that main event that wants to makes you want to tune in to the next week's show. Remember when Raw used to do that, or even if a lot of the other two hours is bad or crap, they'd give you that main event that would suck you back in and, you know, leave you still satisfied somewhat and have you looking forward to next week's show? 
I mean, at this point in time, what are you really looking forward to on next week's show? Yeah, it was nice that there was no Cena this week, that's for sure. But they made sure to mention him plenty. You know, what's there to look forward to? Oh, Cena maybe answering Rollins' challenge, Cena making appearance. Oh boy, the thought of Cena winning the WWE World Heavyweight Championship is incredibly exciting. To all parties involved, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, we can sit there and maybe say you get excited about Lesnar and Taker, but Taker wasn't there this week, so who knows if he's going to be there next week. And frankly, again, when it comes to Heyman the Lesser, so much of it is the same old shit. And when you look at that main event, you know, the baby faces are going over, then why fucking have their matches at SummerSlam? I mean, seriously. It was not a good show this week. Like I said, I already wasn't in the mood for... Uh, raw viewing because, like I said, I really don't like the tribute shows because of what they represent, especially when I think back on the legacy and career of Piper, and I think back on how good he was and how good wrestling used to be, and I see the crap that is shoveled in my direction for three hours every Monday night. Yeah. Not a good show. 